I appreciate so much your dedication to the Lord that has brought you out tonight to continue your worship of God and to seek Him first. I'm glad Jim did mention the meeting that the elders had the last part of this past week in planning for the future and in looking at the needs of this church and addressing those needs. I was just so deeply moved by their love for all of us and their concern for all of us in guiding us and leading us in the Lord's work. And they're committed to this church and they're committed to all of us in doing the Lord's work. And I know that it's a task they're willing to do because there's so many dedicated people here. There's just a a lot of good efforts being put forth to glorify God. And I'm just so impressed with the commitment to truth and study, teaching, and serving the Lord. It is just a remarkable thing. So I, I commend you, friends, for your continued dedication to our God. When the first church was being persecuted by Saul, we know that they eventually dispersed throughout the world, as it talks about in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. This persecution of him going into every house of Christians, especially there in Jerusalem, to take them to jail or to prosecute them for their faith just caused them to, 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 to spread. They came from different parts of the world and they eventually returned to those different parts of the world, but this time they're going back with the gospel. And it says in Acts 11, in verse 19, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. And we can see that was indeed the, the trend. It was the Jews who were receiving the gospel from these Jewish Christians. But that all changed in Acts 10 when Cornelius was converted and at first it was something that was a surprise to the people in Jerusalem. But eventually they accepted the fact that the Gentiles could now receive the gospel. And so they supported it. And it says in Acts chapter 11 that as the gospel is spreading, some of them, or some, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So now you have Greeks who are being taught the gospel, not Jews only. And it's especially happening in the areas of Antioch as it, as it, and Cyrene and Cyprus, as it says here, but especially that of Antioch. And this time, we see that it was a beautiful transition in the history of the gospel, because now you have an entire church, especially there in Syria, that was made up of Gentile converts. A precious scene in the history of God's people, where you have these two races coming together that had been separated for centuries, and not just in the sense of disliking one another. There was some real division among these groups, so much so that the Gentiles could even be killed if they had trespassed on the property of the temple. I mean, this was some serious division that existed among these groups. And now they're being fused into one body, as we see here especially in Acts chapter 11. And back in Jerusalem, they were celebrating this. So much so that it says in verse 22 of Acts 11, then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Now, if you just reel it back a little bit, it wasn't that long before this text when Peter converted Cornelius and the response at Jerusalem was, you even ate with this man? They couldn't believe that he was interacting with Gentiles. But now they had learned the truth and they were <clears throat> aware of God's will for all men to receive the gospel and they rejoiced in it. And when you had this church that was racially diverse, they celebrated it. And not only did they celebrate it, they sent Barnabas to go and support the work. They sent Barnabas to go and contribute to this wonderful work. 
And that not only says a lot about the people at Jerusalem, I believe it says a lot about Barnabas. When you have this situation <clears throat> that could have been handled improperly and all that progress could have been wiped away or flushed down the drain if it was not handled the way it should. But Barnabas did go and he went and he encouraged these people and he built them up. And what I see from this <clears throat> is a man who was able to gain the confidence of the Christians in Jerusalem and the apostles, but also the Gentile brethren. He was able to win their trust because of who he was as a man of God. And because of that, I see in him the definition of an ideal Christian. I mean, if you were to try and diagram what's an ideal Christian, what's the bar for all of us, what's the standard for all of us, what should we all be striving for? What qualities should we be seeking to apply in our life as people who are striving to be the ideal, the pattern, the example, the mold? And I just cannot help but think that Barnabas was one who stood out in this thought. Regardless, we see that he was a, he was a tremendous Christian. Number one, because he was a godly man. And that the Bible just makes reference to this in Acts chapter 11, that as he went to Antioch, it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 24, he was a good man, as it says, a good man. Now, how would you define a good man, a good person? It's important that we define it. I mean, an elder is supposed to be a, a man of a good reputation, a lover of what is good is what 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 saying. In talking about the qualifications, an elder has to love what is good, be a good person, a person who promotes goodness. So what would you include in that? What comes to mind when you think of a good person? Well, I, I think at least one thing would be a person who thinks on good things and does good things, a person who is like God. And maybe that's what is meant as well when it says he was a man, in verse 24, who was full of the Holy Spirit. Now this could have referred back to his ability possibly to perform miracles. That's a possibility. It may have been that. But it also could have referred to his willingness to yield to what the Holy Spirit had revealed. His willingness to let the Holy Spirit abide in him by yielding his will to what had been revealed. We certainly know that that's how it is with us. You're not going to be able to perform miracles by the Holy Spirit. Those days are over, is what the Bible teaches us, especially since all that which is perfect has come. But you are going to have to let the Spirit dwell in you. You are going to have to be full of the Holy Spirit in the sense that you're willing to abide in what the Spirit has revealed. In Galatians chapter 5, it says that you're either going to choose to walk after your flesh or you're going to choose to walk after the Spirit or let the Spirit abide in you. And in doing that, <clears throat> there's going to be evidence of either decision. And he says in Galatians 5 and verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now it could be that's what Barnabas was. He was a man who was full of love and joy, a man who was full of peace and long-suffering and kindness, a good man, as we already noted, his faithfulness. Maybe that's why he was so special. He was just full of these things in looking at his character. But then it says in Acts chapter 11, in verse 24, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith. He was full of faith. And it could refer, yes, to his faith, or it also could refer to his faithfulness in his devotion to the Lord. We see that is definitely something we all need to have, a strong faith, and we need to have faithfulness in describing our relationship with God. That wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. And that is certainly consistent with a person who is godly. So there it is right there. I mean, the first thing you see with this man is he is a man of God. Now, what's neat to this, uh, to me about this is that 
when you look at when a person leaves this world, and they, their, their legacy is considered, whether it be a, a celebrity or an athlete, even when an athlete dies. Well, I mean, Joe Morgan passed away recently, and you have it said of him, he was the best second baseman to ever play the game. And I, I guess that would be true. He, was, he seemed to be a really good man and certainly a good athlete. And that's how people are defined, that they were really good at this sport or this skill or this whatever. They really excelled in that, in their ability to perform. But when you look in the Bible, with God, it's a whole different definition. Like when you go through the kings, you know, you have all the kings that are listed in Israel and Judah, and the thing that God uses to define them is either they were a person who did evil, or they were a person who did the will of God. That all their differences were summarized, you were either wicked or you were good. You were a person of God, you were righteous. And that's how it's going to be with us. It doesn't matter what other skills or abilities we might have or what other contributions we make to society. That's fluff. It doesn't matter. What matters most is whether or not we are a person of God. Whether or not we're a person who is good and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. That's what makes a person significant in the Lord's work. And I see this especially with Barnabas as, I believe, an ideal Christian. But moving on, he wasn't just these things as wonderful as these things are. The Bible goes on to say in describing this man that he was a very generous person. In fact, he was so generous that he lost the name his mother gave him. He entered this world and his mother gave him the name of Joseph. But the apostles, when they witnessed this man's character... They were so impressed with him that they changed his name to Barnabas. And the reason they did that was because he was a man who was given to encouragement. In Acts chapter 4, in talking about this man's character again, it says, Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here you see a man who was very giving in his approach to life. In fact, he was not just giving. He was truly concerned about building people up, full of compassion, helping out the person who was struggling, helping out the person who needed encouragement. And he was so known for this that the apostle says, that guy's the son of encouragement. Or the son of would simply be a phrase that would would highlight something. You know, son of the devil, or whatever it might be, was emphasizing a person's ungodly spirit. Well, here he was such a motivator. He was so concerned about helping people that they changed the man's name. They changed it because of what they saw in him. Now, it says here he was from Cyprus, and having land, most likely in Cyprus... He sold it and gave it to those who were in need, especially within the church. Now, Cyprus was this great island. And I don't know uh, how it was viewed then, but today it's, it's, it's prized. And I wonder if the land then was as prized as it is now. Because it is a beautiful place and it would be a place that would be ideal for vacationing or a resort or whatever. It's just a very beautiful place from what I can tell and from what it is known for. Uh, rich in minerals as well. So was he given up a precious piece of property? Was he giving up something of great value in order to help his friends out? Well, it doesn't matter. I think it was. But still, it doesn't matter because he had property. He was willing to let go of it. And the only reason he did that was because he was concerned about people who needed some financial help, especially his brethren. Are you and I givers? I, I think there's a lot of generosity here. I think there's a lot of generosity in the family of God as a whole from what I can see. And that's no different here. But it's been said there are three types of givers. And I thought this was pretty clever in describing it. That you can be like a flint. You know, the flint rock. That this type of person is a person that you must hammer to get anything out. And even then, you only get small piece, pieces and sparks. 
But you have to really hammer away if you want to get anything from a flint. A second type of giver is a sponge. And here's the person that if you want anything from them, you have to squeeze them. You have to put a lot of pressure on them. And then they're willing to release and let it go. But then it's been said the third type of person is like the honeycomb. And the honeycomb is you just pick this thing up and it just overflows. It overflows with sweetness as can be said. And I think we can see that illustration very well. But what about us? Are we just, it just overflows. Freely I have received, freely I give. Because we are so concerned about helping people. We are so concerned, like Barnabas, in encouraging people, especially with whatever needs they may have, even financially. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 9, that we must be people who are willing to let it go, willing to help people out because we are just so concerned about their condition and we want to use our resources to bless them. In Proverbs 22 and verse 9 it says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Completely generous in all that we do. Well, the apostle said, when it comes to giving, Barnabas stood out, or Joseph stood out, really. Joseph stood out, and they gave him the name Barnabas. He was that type of person. I don't have these verses specifically listed, but in Job chapter 31, I, I, you read through Job 31, and if you want to read with me, I'm going to read here in a second from verse 16 beginning. And I'm going to go through verse 23. I have verse 20 here, but really through verse 23. But when you look at this chapter, and here's a really good chapter if you want to look at some time, of, of Job basically defending his integrity. You know, talking about how he used his eyes to serve the Lord, that he was a man who served God from the heart. He did good unto other people. He never took advantage of people. But he also was able to look at his giving. And he says in Job chapter 31, beginning, where he says that if I have kept the poor from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to fail or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it, but from my youth I reared him as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or any poor man without covering, if his heart has not blessed me, and if he has not warmed, or if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder, let my arm be torn from my socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me, and because of his magnificence I cannot endure. And again, he keeps going and looking at his integrity. But I mean, that's quite an outlook. You know, if, if anybody who was in need in my line of view, if, if I knew about it, and they didn't see me come to the rescue, then let my arm fall from my socket. I mean, I, he, was, he was that committed to helping people out, and as he says even in verse 18, that even from his youth, he says, that, but from my youth I reared him as a father. So even, it seems to be all of his life, he was a person who was helping people out, willing to be like a father figure in coming to the rescue. Generous person. Now we know that he did lose it here in this context, we understand that, but what happened at the end? At the end we see that God gave him back everything he had lost times 10, right? I mean, he, he multiplied this man's resources many times over because he was a person who was willing to use it to help other people. Freely I have been given. Freely I will give. I, I, I heard of a, a Christian who, who looked at it this way. And he said, I tried to give it all away. Yet the more I gave, the more the Lord gave back to me. I mean, he was that generous in, in the way he viewed this world. Completely generous. And I love that. I, that really appeals to me. I love that mentality. And I see that just oozing from Barnabas. A man who was so generous with his blessings. But also he was a man who was generous in his mercy. Now this is seen several times in the references to Barnabas. The first example we see of him showing this especially 
to a person who was down and out was when Paul was converted, but Paul still had a reputation, especially among those in Judea. And he was still known as the Christian killer. And so he comes back to Jerusalem, and people were terrified of him. They just didn't believe Paul had really been converted. They, they thought it was all a stunt. But that all changed when Barnabas went to the apostles and said, we can trust this guy. He's been converted. He's been forgiven. It says in Acts chapter 9 and verse 26 and 27, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Where Paul, what chance would he have had of convincing these people were it not for Barnabas? Barnabas says, we can listen to this guy. Give him a chance. Let him prove himself. And he told of his conversion and that opened the door and we know the rest of the story when it comes to Paul's success. And it wasn't just there. We started this lesson looking at the fact that when somebody was needed to go to Antioch to deal with this very explosive situation of Gentiles being converted in mass and Jewish Christians joining with them, who are we going to send into this situation where it could have been very volatile in, if it wasn't handled properly? Who are we going to send in? Well, let's send in the person who is compassionate. Let's send in the person who is encouraging. Let's send in the person who loves people, who loves the Lord, who loves His work, who's a person rich in mercy to people who need it. Let's send in Barnabas because he's the perfect man for the situation. And he was there a long time. And not only was there a long time, he was able to eventually bring Paul into the situation, and they all continue to do great things for the Lord. Can you and I be like that? Can we be a person who gives a person a second chance to prove himself, to rise above his past, to rise above his sins? Or can we be a person who adds to the work of the church in such a way to where we say that's the person who is going to love people and build people up? And it wasn't just these two examples. I think it's seen again even in Acts 15, as we noted in our study on Acts. But it says in Acts chapter 15 that when Paul was ready to go back and visit the area that he and Barnabas had visited during the first missionary tour or preaching trip, it says that Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, who had, who had abandoned them on that first missionary tour. And it says in verse 37, Barnabas, this is Acts 15, in verse 37 beginning, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. The contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So they had this fallen out. They just could not agree on whether or not to take this guy. Now we understand through the Colossian letter that Barnabas and John Mark were related. But still, it was consistent with his character. He was a man who says, okay, look, the man messed up. He realized he messed up. He wants to commit himself again to this work. Let's give the guy a chance. Let's give him a chance to rise above his past failure and let him preach. Let him support us once more in preaching the gospel. That was an easy conclusion for Barnabas. That, that let's just do this. The guy wants to do better. Let's, let's let him do better. But Paul says, no, wait, we, we can't do that. We, we couldn't con have confidence in this guy the first time when things got rough I'm just not sure he's going to stick it out this time. The question is, who was right? Who was right, Barnabas or Paul? What was God's will in the matter? Did God want John Mark or did he not want John Mark on that second trip? And we understand the answer is God was indifferent. God had not revealed anything. This was not a matter of doctrine. This was a matter of opinion. And God allows us to have our opinions. And when it comes to matters of opinion, we're going to have moments where we do divide. 
and we do disagree. Now, obviously, in looking at the New Testament as a whole, I don't believe this was something that where there was any animosity between the two. Can we disagree strongly to the point that we would, would have different views on something? Can we disagree strongly and still be brethren? I think so. Politics? Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. But go down the list of different matters of opinion. Anybody who's married knows you can definitely disagree on something and still love one another. I don't, I, so I, I'm looking at this, and yes, they were... They, they strongly disagreed with one another, but I don't know if there was any type of hatred in between them. But even if there was, it was corrected because as, as you look at the New Testament, on the third trip, when Paul went through on his third, third trip, when he was at Ephesus, he wrote the letter to the Corinthians. And in that letter, he says in chapter 9 and verse 6 that, you know, can Barnabas and I not have wives? Godly wives and doing our work as apostles and evangelists. And so at that point, especially, there was no animosity in, in between the two. I mean, they spoke f favorably of one another, at least there and in other places. And certainly, Paul had changed his views on John Mark. The very last letter that Paul wrote, and at least penned, it says, he said, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, bring John Mark. Now here's a man who is near his end in life. And he says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So at least by that point, Paul realized, okay, there is great value in this guy called John Mark. But it makes you wonder... Would John Mark had developed to that point had Barnabas not shown him some compassion and had Barnabas not showed him some mercy? And so we see that. We see that as a result of his compassion, he was able to help people rise above their past. Are there, do we have a past? Do we have moments where we fail? What do we need to rise above that? We need a Barnabas. We need to be a Barnabas to help one another overcome our failures and our shortcomings. And that's why this man is so commendable because of this great commitment to mercy. Let me say one last thing, if I may. And that is, I, I, I see a man who was content with his abilities. Now the reason I say this is because Barnabas in himself, he was a man of, of great ability. I mean, he wasn't just sent to Antioch because he was a nice people person. He was sent because he could preach. He could teach in a very effective way. In Acts chapter 11, it says in verse 22, the news of these things came to the ears of J Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So again, he was sent because he could build people all up with the truth. And as a result, a great many people were added to the Lord in verse 24. He was a great preacher. He had skill and ability. But when you look at his relationship with Paul... We see that, yes, he eventually brought Paul to Antioch to do the work there. But in time, you see a transition in how the people are referred to, or at least how people refer to these men. Even at the end of Acts chapter 11, it says that you had Barnabas and Saul. So again, the, the more notable person was mentioned first, Barnabas and Saul. But as you look through the story of Acts, you see that that eventually changed that eventually the person who was in the forefront was Paul and Barnabas, Acts chapter 13 and verse 43, and the same thing in Acts 14 and verse 12. You have Paul and Barnabas. You have Paul who was known as the speaker in Acts chapter 14 and verse 12. And so it, it, there seems to be a, a transition in how they are referred to and possibly how people viewed them. I mean, you look, look at the New Testament. Who stands out more? Paul or Barnabas? And I think we all know the answer to that. But see, here's what's so neat about that. Is that there is no reference to Barnabas ever resenting this notoriety, or at least the recognition, I should say, of what Paul was receiving in preference to him. There's nothing indicated in the scriptures that, that he resented that. 
And if that's true, that's certainly something we can all learn from today. Is it possible for other people to come along, even in the work of the Lord, and do a better job than you? Do a better job than me? Or do a job in such a way to where they get more recognition than we may get? Is that possible? Yeah, it's, it's very much possible. And if our attitude is right, we should want that. We should want that person to do their best in glorifying God. We should never reach the point where we are envious of the attention someone else is receiving in serving the Lord. In Proverbs 14 and verse 30 it says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. You see, it's more than just giving money. Barnabas was a person who completely emptied himself in building people up. And I, I believe that's a good trait for all of us to strive for. In Acts, I'm sorry, Proverbs 13 and verse 7, There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. And one who makes himself poor, yet he has great riches. And Jesus kind of said it this way, that the, the person who places himself first is going to what? Come in last. But the person who places himself last is going to come in first. It's the person who is humble. It's the person who is a servant, a person who elevates other people, who is of great value in the kingdom of Christ. Well, you've listened very patiently, and I thank you so much, friends, because I, I just think these things are so important. Uh, Barnabas, I just love this guy. I love, I love what is said about him. I love the, I love the image in the Word of God that this man is given He's a man of God. He's a man of generosity. He's a man of mercy. And he's a man who is content with the praise others were receiving. And I just like that. And I think these are things we can all benefit from in looking at our own life as Christians. I, I hope you're a great asset to the Lord. I hope you're a tremendous asset to the Lord. I hope you are not only like Barnabas, I hope you are like our Lord. could be that you're here... <clears throat> and not a child of God, we hope you would obey the gospel. That you would come to the Lord and be set free from your past and from your sins. And we can all do this through that beautiful blood of Christ as we talked about this morning. You know, even in Acts 16, as we looked at in the study of our class this morning, that you, you have a man there who was about to take his life, but he decided not to because of the encouraging words that Paul and Silas shared with him. And he told this man who asked what to do to be saved to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That, there's your hope, is the person who defeated the grave. And so they spoke the word of the Lord to him, Acts 16 and verse 32. And that night he took them and he washed their stripes, which was a symbol of repenting, of punishing Paul and Silas for preaching the gospel. And so it says immediately he and his family were baptized. And the reason they were baptized, Acts 16 and verse 33, is because that's what Jesus wants people to do, to come out of the world and be separate. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So we hope you would do that tonight if you are ready to be set free. Or if you need to make things right with God in a public way, please come to Him as we stand and sing.